Welcome to the Walkworthy Podcast, a podcast by Hespler Baptist Church located in Cambridge, Ontario. Our local church exists to make disciples who walk worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. We hope and pray this is an encouragement to you and to anyone else you share this with. Well, good morning to all of you. My name is Rick Reed, and I have the joy of welcoming you all to Hespeller Baptist Church today. This is a joyful day. We get to do what we do every Sunday. We come and we worship the Lord. We give Him thanks. We give Him honor for all that He's done for us in Christ Jesus. And today, though, we have a special focus to our worship service. Today is the ordination service for Brian Vautour. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you kind of know what to expect because it's an unusual thing for a church, but you actually had two ordination services within the span of just some weeks, and Pastor Caleb Hall was ordained, and we had a special service for him just a few weeks back. So uh, today we're going to do something similar. Um, Ruth Savin is uh, at the piano. She and her husband, Ryan, are dear friends of Julie and Brian's. Uh, Ruth attends Grace Bible Church here in town, another great church. And she's going to be leading us in our musical worship. And then a little bit later, we'll sing our praises to the Lord. And then Pastor Caleb will give a charge to Brian. And then Pastor Sean will be giving a charge to all of us as the congregation. So that's where we're headed. You know, uh, Brian has prepared a great deal for this day. He completed his Master of Divinity at Heritage Theological Seminary. I had the joy of being one of his professors, and so I can tell you that this young man has a keen interest in the Word of God and real some very strong leadership gifts. He's completed or is completing a pastoral residency here at HBC. So for the last couple of years, he's been, uh, he and Julie have been plugged in and they've been serving well with your team. And uh, so now he's going to be commissioned. He went through an ordination council. If you're unfamiliar with that, that's where pastors from the area gather and they probe him in the area of his biblical knowledge, his theological convictions, and his personal life and credibility. So it's a pretty rigorous process, and they recommended to this congregation that you ordain, Brian, to gospel ministry. So that's what we're going to do today. But today has a little twist. Usually when you ordain someone... A church does that. It means they're asking them to be ordained and to stay on and serve at their church. But you're not doing that, are you? We're actually sending Brian out. As you know, he is a member of the Canadian Forces. He's been appointed as a chaplain and will be serving up near Ottawa at a base in Petawawa. So he and Julie will be moving later this summer. And uh, we are commissioning him, in a sense, to go out from us but to represent Christ and to represent this church as they serve the men and women in our forces. And we're honored to have some of Brian's colleagues and supervisors here today from the forces. So welcome to all of you, as well as the family and friends who are here for this special day as well. So Brian and Julie, I guess a personal word I want to give you. Linda and I have really enjoyed getting to know you. We have sensed from the beginning a kindred heart. You love for the Lord, the love for others. Uh, We served together with Brian and Julie running an alpha course just down the street at one of the cafes here in in Hespeler, and that was a joy. We got to know them well. We've seen how they uh, work together so well, and we, Linda and I, joined with many others to uh, just say we commend you. We respect you in the Lord. We love you, and we're excited for you. And I get to read a call to worship for us, and it's a verse that means a lot to Brian. And I bring it to us as a call to worship, but to you, Brian, as a special encouragement. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, And I am sure of this. Let me just stop there. How many things are you really sure of? As I get older, some of those things that I was sure of when I was younger, I'm not quite as sure about them today. But there are some things that I'm more sure of today than I've ever been sure of. And what the Bible says here is one of them. Because the Bible gives us the sure word. It says this, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Brian and Julie, God has begun a good work in you. He brought you to himself through faith in Christ. You've trusted Jesus, not in just some general way, but you put your faith in Christ as your Savior 
and as your captain, as your leader, as your Lord. He's brought you to a sense of shared conviction that he's calling you to serve him with his life in the chaplaincy, and that's an exciting thing. So he's begun a great work, but the promise is he'll complete it. He'll work in you, he'll work through you until the day he calls you home or Jesus comes to take us home. So we want to begin today with a word of prayer where we uh, affirm that and celebrate that and then lift our hearts as Ruth leads us as we sing our praises to the Lord. Would you join me? In fact, would you stand with me as we uh, pray and invite the Lord's kindness and goodness on this service as we lift our hearts to him? Father in heaven, we come before you today. Today is a joyful day on many levels. It's also a sacred and holy day. It's a day we come to say to you like we do every week, you are our life. You gave us the life of your son Jesus, who loved us and gave himself as a sacrifice for our sin. And now we have hope. We have hope of being clean and being loved and being forever with you. We also have the hope and the charge of getting to live our lives in a way that pleases you. So today, we come here to give you ourselves because you've given us all that you are in Christ. But we also come here today in a special way to commission our brother, Brian, into your gospel ministry. Lord, he's shown himself faithful. He and Julie have sensed your call. It's been affirmed by others. And now today, we officially, as a church body, ordain commission, and soon send them out to be a light for Christ in the Canadian forces. We pray that our singing would bring joy to your heart and that through your word you would bring strength to ours. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. 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 I have the privilege of reading the word of God to you this morning. And I indeed say it's a privilege and an honor to be a very small part of Brian's ordination. I'm his father, Paul Vautour. So, I just needed that, that plug. <laughs> We're going to read uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 13. So, if you could open your Bibles to that. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 13. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there's some blue Bibles in the pews in front of you. So, just grab one of them. And it's on page 995 in the blue Bible. And if you don't own a Bible, feel free to take it home with you. So, and make it your Bible. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 13. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. And trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as he preached in my, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound in chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy for, if we had died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is the word of the Lord. Well, please just afford me a moment to pray before we begin. Our great God, we acknowledge before you this morning the significance of moments like this. 
not only because we are installing Pastor Brian as a minister of the gospel, not only, Lord, because we celebrate with him and with Julie and all of their family for all that you have done in his life to bring him to this point, but, Lord, also because we are opening up your word, and your word is authoritative, it is sufficient, it does not err, and, Lord, it speaks to the most intimate places of our conduct and of our lives, and it leads us in the way of salvation. And so help us, Lord, to walk down these righteous paths as we hear from your word this morning in brief. And I pray, Lord, that these words would especially edify and be an admonishment to our brother Brian. This we pray for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All God's people say, Amen. Brian, today is a significant day in your life and the life of our local church As a congregation, we really are thrilled to ordain you for gospel ministry. I am pleased to be preaching a charge to you, and in a few moments' time, don't be counting the moments, Sean will give the church a charge. It has been a joy, brother, to minister, um, um, to have you minister among us, and to have you fellowshipping with us over the last two years. They have gone by extremely fast. You and Julie have been a major blessing in the life of our church, and you will be sorely missed. This time has been a gift from the Lord. I've especially enjoyed serving alongside you and will miss having you around the office. This morning, though, I feel a sense of urgency as I speak to you, brother. I feel a sense of urgency because life is short. Your days and my days are numbered. I feel a sense of urgency because you will be moving to Petawawa in eight weeks' time. This urgency is driven also by the preciousness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is driven by the cultural climate that is eroding all around us. And I feel this sense of urgency because the truth of God, the God who has made us and the God who loves us, matters. And lastly, I feel this sense of urgency because the tone of the text that was on the front page of your ordination statement is urgent. And so as we turn to 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5 and read the words contained there, I need you to know that I am speaking as a dying man to a dying man. I speak as a vapor to another vapor. I speak as a man who can hear the footfalls of heaven behind him. And it is with these things in mind that I charge you this morning, brother, to fulfill your ministry in Christ. Let's read these words from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Timothy, uh, Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing And by his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Brother Paul is urgent all over this text. Second Timothy is his last letter, verses 6 to 8. If we were to keep reading after where we dropped off, they indicate that his days are numbered, and thus he gives this charge to his young disciple Timothy. These are my, this is my last exhortation, Timothy. Timothy, take these words and do with them what they command. And brother, I want you to look with me at four features of this urgent gospel charge. First, look with me in verse 1 at the priority of this gospel charge. Do you see the priority of the gospel charge? 
Paul wastes no words. The gravity of the situation is evident from verse 1. This charge is given first in the presence of God. Paul reminds Timothy that God is witness to this charge to fulfill his ministry. Brother, the omniscient one, the one who knows all things, has called you to the chaplaincy. The omnipresent one, the one who is everywhere present, has called you to the chaplaincy. The omnipotent one, the one who is all-powerful, has called you to the chaplaincy. And I charge you in the presence of the living God this morning to be faithful to your calling. And so Paul charges Timothy in the presence of God, but Paul also charges Timothy in view of Christ's return. Paul reminds Timothy about the judgment of God, the appearing of God, the kingdom of God. All of these things are eschatological, end times. He desires that Timothy will minister with the sound of the footfalls of heaven behind him. And so, brother, minister like your days are numbered. Minister in view of the fact that you will give an account to God for all that you have said and all that you have done. James 3.1 says, There will be a judgment of greater strictness for those who teach, and your conduct in the chaplaincy teaches. Your words in the chaplaincy teaches. Your counsel in the chaplaincy teaches. And so in view of Christ's return, fulfill your ministry. Remember the priority of your gospel charge. You have been charged in the presence of God here this morning, and you will give an account to God for all that you do. You have been called to the chaplaincy by the only true and living God, and in light of the priority of this gospel charge, fulfill your ministry. Well, what, is, what are you charged to do? Paul doesn't leave Timothy with, without the answer for very long. We get to verse 2, and we see this second feature of this urgent gospel charge. We see the mandate of the gospel charge in verse 2. What is your mandate, Timothy? Preach the word. You are a herald of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Your mandate is not to preach the word when it is convenient or only when you anticipate that it will bear good results. Your mandate is not to preach the word to those who won't mind you doing so or when it will make you popular. Your mandate is to preach the word in every sort of season when it is risky when it is unpopular, when you are expecting to preach it, and when you are not expecting to preach it. The word sets the agenda, not us. Brother, as you preach the word, remember the parable of the soils. The word is scattered liberally, and there are a variety of responses. There's the hard-hearted hearers. The word is scattered, and the devil comes, and he snatches it away. These are the hard-hearted There are the rocky ground hearers. They they initially receive the word with joy, but hardship comes and they reject it. They have no roots in and of themselves. And so in the end, they're no better than the hard-hearted hearers. There are the thorny ground hearers. The cares of this life um, grow up around them and choke them out. And so once again, they're no better than the hard-hearted hearers. But then there is the good soil. And God has guaranteed us that there is good soil, for he asks us to spread the seed of his word liberally. They are those who hear the word, accept it, and they bear fruit 30, 40, 60, 100 fold. God takes hold of them by his spirit, and they take hold of him by faith. As you preach the word, brother, remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7. Someone plants... Someone waters, and you might have a role in one or either of those things, but it is God who causes the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but God who gives the growth. As you preach the word, brother, remember that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As you preach the word, remember that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It pierces the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So as you preach the word, brother, remember all of these things. Let the word do its work and just liberally scatter it. But to preach the word, 
You must be a lifelong student of the word. Saturated in the word, steered by the word, nourished by the word. How else can you be ready in season and out of season unless you're a student of the word? To preach the word, you must be a man of prayer, confident in the work of the spirit. Ministry is done on one's knees. Chaplaincy is done on one's knees. And to preach the word, you must be also, notice in verse 2, a patient man. Brother, let the Spirit of God use the Word of God to do the work of God in the timing of God. Ministers of the gospel are gardeners and farmers. A gardener does not plant his seeds and expect growth the next morning. A farmer does not sow his seeds in the field and expect growth the next morning. No, brother, be a patient man as you liberally scatter the Word. With this mandate to preach the Word in view, brother, fulfill your ministry. But notice also the third feature of this gospel charge. Paul gives Timothy the reason for this gospel charge. The reason for the gospel charge in verses 3 and 4. A time is coming when two realities will concurrently take place. First, people will reject the well of sound teaching and truth that is available to them. And B, second, they will run to other wells for nutrition that ends up not being any sort of nutrition whatsoever. Rather than seeking the truth, people will look for teachers that will affirm them. Anything that gives them pleasure, they're looking for that a- affirmation externally. And don't we, don't we live in a culture that epitomizes this? The black hole of the internet is shooting us any sort of ideas that fits with whatever weird sort of view we have. We are inundated all the time by what we might just call self. I might have a propensity to like this sort of thing, and the internet will just feed it to me all day long. The next, the next video on my YouTube uh, feed, recommended for you. Oh, man, I'd, I'd love to watch that. Well, it's because you watch 25 others like that. It, you know, it, it's, it's the same with social media as well. What we click on is what we are fed. We will accumulate teachers such that we exist in an echo chamber of self, an echo chamber of what this text calls myth. Look with me at verse 3 and 4. Time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers suited to their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And this accumulation of teachers, Paul says, is a turning away. The bottom line is, it is a turning away from the truth. The truth which Jesus says will set us free. The truth which tells us that we were made by God and for God, that we are his beloved creatures living in his world, that we are fallen creatures in need of salvation, and that God offers salvation to us through The Lord Jesus Christ, his beloved son, who is fully God and fully man and who came to this earth to pay the penalty for our sins. Brother, this is is the word of Christ. This is the gospel. This is the good news. It is the truth that sets us free. And you must preach this good news of repentance and faith. Why? Because there are lost souls who exist in this world and we need it. And they are wandering off into myths and they are deluding themselves. This is truth. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it frees us from sin. It frees us to live the life that we were made to live. Brother, in light of these times that we are in, fulfill your ministry. The fourth feature of this text, the fourth feature of this urgent gospel charge is found in the last verse. We've seen the priority of the gospel charge the mandate of the gospel charge to preach the word, the reason for the gospel charge, and notice, fourthly, in verse 5, the man of the gospel charge. The, command in, the commands in verse 5 are to characterize your ministry, Brian. There is a call, look with me at verse 5, there is a call to be sober-minded. Some translations um, helpfully translate this, keep your head, Brian, keep your head. It's best illustrated by the difference between sober, uh, by the difference between being sober and being drunk. 
Have a clear view, eyes wide open, doctrinally informed, patient, calculated. Be sober-minded. Second, endure suffering. Endurance is found, we find in Hebrews 12, in looking to Jesus Christ. Be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Share with others how you've been brought out of darkness into the marvelous light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Share with others how you, they will spin their tires in the muck of futility if they do not place their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your conduct and your words be the aroma of life to the perishing. Brother, do the work of an evangelist. And I think we can all affirm here that because of the work that God has done in your life, And because of the work that you have seen God do through his word in his people, you are a zealous and a passionate and a motivated evangelist for you want others to know the hope that is within you so that they might share in that hope. And I praise God for that. Number four, brother, fulfill your ministry. That's the fourth command given in these verses and the theme of this text, fulfill your ministry. I love what Andreas Kostenberger writes in his commentary. He says, It is easier to start well than to finish well. I entered a long-distance race a number of years ago, and I trained pretty well for it, pretty well. You can ask my wife. And I got to about kilometer X. (laughs) Got to save some dignity somewhere. And there was a hill on kilometer X, which Mark Putt, would love to talk to all you folks about the difficulty of in Collingwood. And by the time I got to this hill, I was not any longer running as fast as I had for the previous X amount of kilometers. It is easier to start well than to finish well. Brother, fulfill your ministry. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ, proclaim his gospel, and be wowed every day by all the beauty that it is to know Christ. Fulfill your ministry, brother. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean. For those of you who don't know me, and as Dr. Reed mentioned earlier in our service, I have the privilege of letting Brian off the hook because uh, Caleb has uh, done a tremendous job presenting a strong and solid charge to you, brother. I'm glad that he has done so. And uh, my responsibility at this point in our service as we continue is to give a charge to us as a congregation. Now, in doing so, I want to ask you just to first turn to Titus 3. So if you're still in 2 Timothy, just turn a couple pages. It's page 999 in the blue book, so just a few pages over. I'm not going to read it now. I'm not going to start here, but I'm going to end here. I just want you to be ready for Titus 3, verse 13. So like I said, I'm not starting here. I'm going to end here. And if you cheat and look down, maybe you'll be wondering a little bit how I'm going to get there, but we will. So Titus 3:13 is where we're heading and where we will conclude. But I want to begin... Uh, this portion by saying that there's a phrase that's increasingly been on my mind of late as the time for both Brian's ordination service and his departure have drawn near together. And it comes from Ecclesiastes 3, and it will serve a little bit as the framework of the charge I wish to give to our church, but stay open to Titus 3. This is the phrase in Ecclesiastes 3. It says this, For everything there is a season... And a time for every matter under heaven, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to embrace, and there's a time to refrain from embracing. And to echo what Caleb has already said, church, I believe that I can speak confidently for all of us when I say that these last two years of embracing both Brian and Julie have been an absolute delight. And I hear an amen on that. In a very short period of time, after coming among us, it felt like they'd always been here, which I mean in the best of ways. 
as members. They slipped in seamlessly to serve faithfully alongside of us. At the pastoral staff level, Brian's leadership ability, which Dr. Reed mentioned, his heart for the gospel, which Caleb mentioned, his skill with people, and his willingness to serve where needed have been invaluable to us as a church in two difficult years. At a time when life was harder and we were looking to add another full-time pastor, I believe the Lord graciously and generously met our needs by giving Brian to us for a season. As the time for this embracing has almost come to an end and the time for them to relocate so that we must refrain from embracing in the ways that we have, there's no doubt in my mind that we will miss them keenly and feel their absence significantly. And that reality brings me to one encouragement and two exhortations in relation to this theme of embracing and refraining from embracing. First, an encouragement. Church, one of the reasons I believe Brian and Julie were able to be so quickly at home among us is because of you. You opened your homes to them. You opened your hearts to them. You graciously gave opportunity for Brian to serve. You gladly sat under his teaching and his preaching. You prayed for him. You encouraged them. You sharpened them. You strengthened them. And now, to a great extent, this was easy because of the kind of guy that Brian is and has grown even more to be as we've witnessed his progress. I don't believe there are many pastoral residents out there like you, brother. Nevertheless, church, you still invested in Brian and Julie, knowing from the outset that his time, their time among us had a fixed end date and they, they would leave and go serve others elsewhere. So all, for all of that, because of that, all the more I thank and praise God for the way that you have approached this reality and I commend you highly for doing so. But what all this means is that their absence from us, it's going to be real, I'm going to feel it, Our staff is going to feel it. I think our church is going to feel it. And because of this, I believe that there may be an understandable hesitancy from going down the road of welcoming someone else in after Brian leaves and then going through the same process over again. But what I want to ask of you is to do it is to do it again, and again, and again, and again, as often as the Lord would enable and allow us to do so as a church. Please don't let any sorrow or cost that comes from the refraining to embrace that we're about to experience, please don't let any of that keep us from opening our homes and our hearts and our church to future men the Lord is raising up for gospel ministry. So I do exhort you to continue this servant-hearted, kingdom-minded, apostolic, modeled of welcoming future ministers in and then sending them back out for their sake and for the sake of the church and for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just listen for a few moments to how much this dynamic was woven into the approach of the Apostle Paul in his practice and his letters. Consider, I'm just going to read a number of different verses, and I want you just to listen to this network of men and women Paul was constantly embracing, sending, commending, and then refraining from embracing for the sake of the church and the gospel. So just listen, and then we'll land in Titus 3.13. It'll be the last one that I read. So I'm just going to read them. If you want the references later, I can happily supply them to you. This is from Acts chapter 16, beginning there. Paul came also to Derba and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Romans 16 verse 1 says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. 1 Corinthians 16, 10 and 11. When Timothy comes, 
See that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. The next verse. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come. He will come when he has opportunity. 2 Corinthians 8. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you, for he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Second Corinthians 9. I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Second Corinthians 12. I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Ephesians 6, so that you also may know how I am doing and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Philippians 2, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. I was a son with a father. He has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. A few verses later, I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Colossians 4. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. The next verse, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. 1 Thessalonians 3, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. First Timothy 3, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Paul writes to Timothy, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Titus chapter 1, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you may, might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then Titus 3 We have here, verses 12 and then verse 13. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And what I've just read to you is a New Testament equivalent of Paul's social media friend list or his LinkedIn profile. He's this apostolic general constantly embracing, sending, commanding, and being willing to refrain from embracing for the sake of the church and for the sake of the gospel. He is dispatching troops all over the place, even when that comes at great cost to himself. He's willing to disciple those who have most promise, such as Timothy, commended to him in Acts chapter 16. And then he is willing, even though he has no one like Timothy, he is willing to send Timothy away so that others could benefit. Why would he do this? Why would he go through this constant cycle of being strengthened by these brothers, by these men, and then sending them off? Why would he do that? Because Christ is worth that. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation, Paul writes. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
See, Paul had such an enlarged vision of the, the preeminence of Christ, knowing that there is none like him, that he is worth our all and our best, and we will train up and send out those that we can to help the world know this one that they need to know. For Christ alone is the one who takes us when we are alienated from God, which some of you still might be this morning. He takes when we were hostile in mind, we were, when we were doing evil deeds, it is Christ who reconciled us to God in his body of flesh by his death in order that people might be presented before God holy and blameless and above reproach. As Caleb mentioned, there are men and women everywhere, everywhere, who need to hear of the good news of Jesus, who died for our sins and who rose from the dead victorious over sin and Satan and death. And so, church, I exhort you this morning to place the same value on what Paul did so that we will repeatedly embrace and refrain from embracing men who are called by God to be ministers of the gospel and to do this for the sake of the church and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I say this in particular to you, brothers and sisters, because as more time passes and the more pastoral residents we have among us, the more I'm thinking of our church like a pastoral greenhouse. This is not a perfect environment, because we are not a perfect church, and you're looking at one obvious reason for why that is. But by God's grace, I do believe there are many reasons that this is a healthy environment. And for decades now, the fruit of this has been evident as young men have come to Hesper Baptist Church and gone from Hesper Baptist Church. Two who are thrilled to have stayed, Caleb and myself, and by God's grace, our desire... And my charge to you this morning is that we would pray and labor for more of the same. There is a need for you to keep opening your hearts and homes to future pastors. For you to be willing that Caleb and Kevin and I give some of our limited time to future pastoral residents, which may mean a little bit less time for you. There's a need for us to grow in our worship by increasing our giving so that our budget begins to grow so that there is more there to support future pastoral residents such as we have had in our brother Brian. The church, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth, needs such men, and it seems that right now the need is growing greater. I had an email from a brother a few weeks ago who has a a, a service, a website and a service to help churches find pastors and to help pastors find churches. And he sent an email to me because he knew of two churches in our province who are looking for churches, and he asked me if I knew anyone. I've never met this man. He found our church through the Gospel Coalition. And I emailed back and forth a little bit with him, and he said, you know, in the States... He contacts a lot of people in churches, and he said, there's a lot of contacts that need to be made to help a church find a pastor and a pastor of church and, and so on. But he said, in Canada, it's like thousands of contacts need to be made. It's hard to find pastors in the States. It's even harder in this country. And so the need is great. And so I do exhort you to be willing to keep doing what you've done with Brian and Julie and others before him for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church. Now, in saying all of this, I don't believe for a moment that our commitment to Brian and Julie all of a sudden ends when they leave us in July. They might be thinking, and you might be thinking, hang on a second, they're not even out the door yet, and you're talking about future other people. I'm not just suggesting that we cut ties and move on. Yes, I want you to be encouraged in the way you've embraced them. Yes, I want to exhort that we do the same with others again and again and again. But as we refrain from embracing Brian and Julie in the ways we have embraced them these last two years, we do not refrain from embracing them entirely. And that last reference of Paul's that I read was Titus 3.13. I repeat, do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. 
Here Paul is writing to Titus and to a church, urging them to do all that they can to help two men on their way for the sake of God's kingdom. One is a Roman jurist, likely, and Apollos is mentioned other times in the New Testament. He's a well-known preacher of the gospel. Do your best to see they lack nothing. So as Brian and Julie go from us to serve the Lord elsewhere, these are important words for us, and I believe there will be a willing enthusiasm to ensure that this is so. I know this because we recently received an email from one woman in our congregation. This is what she writes. I feel quite strongly that we need to support Brian and Julie as they enter this new chapter. Should we not be supporting them as we send them? I know that this is a paid position for Brian. Thank you, Canadian Armed Forces, and your tax dollars. Uh, So they won't need that, but what tangible things can we do as a church to show them they are supported by us? Would they not benefit from knowing that we are sending them and, and supporting them? Can we not commission them as we go? They could maybe send us regular notes on how we can pray for them. We could be in regular communication with them as well. And she says this, I just think at the end of the July, a July when they leave, saying to them, see ya, is not good enough. I could not agree more, sister. I could not agree more. And so my second exhortation is that we refrain from embracing them in a very limited sense by speeding them on their way and ensuring that they lack nothing. How do we do that for them? How do we provide a tailwind to fill their sails as they leave? I have three suggestions. Number one, between now and the end of July, take time. Whether in writing or in a card or in conversation, take time to express to Brian and Julie any ways the Lord has used them in your life and in the life of our church over these last two years. Words of encouragement are so few and far between, but they are incredibly powerful. And I believe that that would speed them on their way for them to be able to look back over these last two years and see, yes, the Lord used us here and we can trust that the Lord will use us again. So encourage them in a very particular way. Number two, open your hearts and homes to them during the times they're back among us when they have leaves of absence from the armed forces. They will be back. They've got family nearby. They have no choice. But we expect that they will be among us here. And so on those Sundays, I'm sure we'll get a heads up. Just throw open your arms, open your doors, and welcome them in, that you might encourage them. And number three, most importantly of all, commit to praying for them. In Ephesians 6, 18 to 20, Paul concludes his section on the armor of God with these words. He says, Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and listen to this, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, For which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We need to pray that way because there is people out there who want teachers to satisfy their ears, as Caleb said. In Colossians, Paul also writes, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And then he asks for this prayer request. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. He wants to be bold. He wants to be clear. And then in 2 Thessalonians 3.1, Paul asked for yet more prayer with respect to evangelism and the proclamation of the gospel. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. And when you combine all of those together, let us commit to praying that Brian would experience an open mouth that clearly and boldly proclaims the gospel, an open door through which those words can freely travel, and then open hearts in whom the word of the Lord would speed ahead and be honored. But don't just say that you will commit to praying. 
I want to exhort you to follow through. It's so easy, isn't it? And I've been guilty of this at times. Sure, I'll pray for you, and it never happens. I'm sure we can all relate. Talk is very cheap in that regard. But knowing this man who has served faithfully among us, and knowing the work that the Lord has called him to do, let's follow through in this commitment. And here's one simple suggestion to help us in this way, and I almost never do this, Take out your phone. Seriously, take out your phone. And I want to suggest, I'm not going to bind your conscience by any means, but I want to suggest that you set an alarm on your phone for at least one day a week at 1.28 p.m. I'm serious, you're not, I don't hear the rustling. Get your phones. (laughs) And set an alarm for at least one day a week at 1.28 p.m., make sure it's p.m. and not a.m. Someone won't thank you for that. And when the alarm goes off, just stop and pray for as long as you're able for Brian and for Julie. If you want to pray more regularly, that's up to you. Set an alarm for multiple days in the week. Why 1.28 p.m.? Because those are the first three digits of Brian's service number in the Canadian Armed Forces. a service he will fulfill as a Baptist chaplain, as an extension of you, of us, who have invested in this brother, along with Heritage Seminary. Thank you, Dr. Reed, for your contribution this morning and for the work that you are doing. It is vital. We love it. We've invested along with Grace Bible Church. It's so good to have... Ruth with us, leading us in song this morning. Thank you for your uh, participation and for representing Grace Bible Church. You have had such a significant influence in Brian and Julie's life. We serve together in this great commission mandate that the Lord Jesus has given to us. And so in this, brothers and sisters, I believe we would fulfill the law of love to Brian and Julie, that one debt that we owe to one another. And we do so not because we are extraordinary people who just happen to be inherently others-focused. We are only able to love others this way out of love for God because God first loved us. Brian and Julie, I know you have family who are here with you today, and I know you have friends who are here with you today, and And they might not be Christians, and I'm thrilled that they're with us, but maybe scratching their heads, wondering why it is that a room full of people this size, of different ages and stages, and from different walks of life, would want to think of you and treat you the way that we do. All we can point to as an answer for that is the person of Jesus Christ. We are united by faith in him, the one who died to save a people for himself from every tribe and language and tongue and nation, the one who rose to secure eternal life for all who believe in him, who are invited to one day feast with him in the new heavens and a new earth. And he himself prayed for all who would believe in him this way, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so if you are not a Christian with us this morning, if there's anything that pleases you or intrigues you in what you have seen and heard this morning, please know that that has very little to do with Brian and Julie and very little to do with us, but it has everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. We destroyed ourselves in our sin, but God who made us has made us anew in Christ, and he can make new, new. His grace, his love, his power, his forgiveness are more than sufficient to remake any and all who would come to him in repentance and faith. He's all we have. He's all we need. And this, along with Brian and Julie, we long for the world to know. Let me pray, and then we will sing. Our Lord and our God, we are so grateful for 
these moments that we have spent in your word together. Thank you for Caleb's scattering of this seed and for uh, the scattering that has happened after that. I pray that you would be pleased to water and to give growth, to produce a harvest in Brian and Julie and through them and many others and also in and through the life of our local church so that Jesus Christ would increase and that we would decrease. Help us, Lord, to not only be hearers of your word, but doers also, that we might walk worthy of the gospel as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And we thank you most of all for our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to lift our voices in an even greater way than we have already this morning, to lift high his matchless name. For this we ask in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen. after. Uh, this is the point I was supposed to invite Brian and Julie and the elders. We're going to sing after that. And then Brian has a few words for us, and then we're going to sing again. So elders, please come and pray. I was not reading the service order. Thank you, Mark. I just wanted to sing really bad. And I do, but we should pray. So we've got... Uh, Pastors, elders, elder interns joining us up here. DJ, if you're here, please come on up, brother. And uh, these men are going to lead us in praying for a different aspect of Brian and Julie's life and their ministry that's coming. And we're going to lay hands on them as the pattern of Scripture teaches us to do. I'm just going to ask some questions like we did for Caleb a few weeks ago of you. And then I'm going to ask some questions of you, church. So let me just do that first before we pray. Brian, do you resolve to preach and teach the scriptures as the inerrant and inspired word of God, always giving it authority over all authority? Do you resolve to be consistent in your study of the word of God, showing yourself approved and a workman unto God? Do you resolve to maintain the primary doctrines you affirmed during your ordination council? Do you resolve to live up to the qualifications of a pastor found in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, and Titus 1? Julie, this one's for you, but Brian's answering. Do you resolve to love your wife as Christ loved the church and lead your family in the fear and admonition of the Lord? Do you resolve to not only encourage and train other Christians to witness, but to be a witness by sharing the gospel with those who are not Christians? And do you resolve in the future to only engage in ordaining men who are truly qualified for gospel ministry? Church, now it's your turn. Do you resolve to encourage Brian and Julie in their ministry of the gospel whenever they are among us? We do. Good. Church, do you resolve to pray for Brian and Julie as they depart and while they conduct the ministry we believe God has called them to? Okay, let's pray. And the kids are coming in. We're going to pray for Pastor Brian this morning. That's what we're going to do. And these are the elders of our church. And so sit tight. We're going to pray. And uh, Brian is soon going to be going somewhere else to tell other people about Jesus. And so we want to pray that God would help him and that many people would hear that Jesus is the Son of God, he's the Savior of the world, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that he's coming again. We want people to know this and believe this and be saved. And so we need God's help. We can't do it without God's help. So we're going to ask God to help us, to help Brian and Julie now. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, our hearts are overflowing with joy and thanksgiving this morning for all that you have done in the life of our brother and our friend Brian. Father, we praise you for his life, for his parents, for Paul, for Karen. We praise you for his wife, Julie, and the many, many things that you have done in them and through them to bring us to this moment. Father, we especially praise you and thank you for the faith, the gift of faith that you worked in Brian, even as a young man and even to this moment right now. And we especially praise you today, Father, for all of the work that you have done for the strong calling in Brian's life to be a chaplain in the Canadian Armed Forces. Father, make him a great blessing of your common grace to all that he will minister to. And we pray especially for those that will be among Brian's flock who are your children, and we pray that you would bless him as a shepherd as he does that work. 
Father, we also thank you for the many gifts that you have given to Brian and how you have equipped him to do this special work. Continue to strengthen him, we pray. Heavenly Father, we are deeply grateful to you that by your grace, the work of your spirit, that we have found Caleb, uh, Caleb, we have found Brian to be a man who is above reproach and who holds sound doctrine, who is humble and willing to serve his wife, your people, his country, the men and women who will be in his charge. Father, we thank you for this grace, but what he has need of, what we all have need of, is endurance, that he would believe and keep believing, that he would be humble and remain humble, that he would trust and keep trusting, that he would know and keep knowing you and your people. So, Father, we pray that your spirit would continue to be upon him, that what we have found to be true of him today would remain true of him throughout his life, and that he would be faithful as you are faithful to him, that he would love and know you, and that he would help others to come to know and love you. So, Father, do this work in him, I pray. Yes, <clears throat> yes, Lord, we would ask that you would protect Brian and Julie in their marriage. We pray that in Brian's service and ministry, that all of his actions, <clears throat> interactions with all people at all times would be pure and above reproach. We ask that in times of separation, you would keep them completely devoted to one another. We pray that Brian would be the leader at home by clothing himself with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Father, may they together bear with each other in all situations, whether happy or difficult, and be willing to forgive as you have forgiven us. O Lord, strengthen their love for one another, and through the indwelling of your spirit, help and enable Brian to strive at all times to love Julie as you have loved the church. Lord, we pray as Brian preaches and shares your word, that you would allow it to bring fruit, that you would cause it to fall on good soil that there would be men and women who don't know you that would uh, ask him to know the hope that he has and that he would be able to share that faithfully and that they would come to faith in Christ. And we pray also that as he uh, cares for those who do know you, that you would cause his labor to bear fruit. Uh, that they, he would see men and women grow to maturity in Christ, to find their, their joy, their hope, they're all in you. And we pray this for his ministry. And Lord, we know that the evil one is opposed to the work that you have done in Brian's work uh, in, in Brian's life and the work, Lord, that um, he longs to do as he rubs shoulders with other men and women and proclaims to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that as this roaring lion, the devil, prowls around and looks to destroy, we do ask, Lord, that you would help both Brian and Julie to resist him standing firm in their faith. We are thankful, Lord, that we have been given the armor of God, and so we pray that they would clothe themselves regularly in the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is your word, the shield of faith, which extinguishes every dart of the evil one. Lord, I pray that they would put on for a breastplate righteousness and that they would shod their feet with the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in these things, Lord, help them to stand. We pray for Jesus' sake. And Heavenly Father, as we as a church contemplate Brian and Julie leaving us, in the summer to serve in Petawawa, our hearts are heavy at the prospect of no longer being able to be together with them in person. We ask that you would help us to encourage and support Brian and Julie as the Philippian church did for Paul by entering into partnership with them as they begin their service. Lord, we ask that you would make us aware of their needs, 
so that we can be encouragers to Brian and Julie, just as they have so consistently been encouragers to all of us. Help us to practice the one another commands from Jesus and Paul to the church so that we may continue to foster deep relationships with Brian and Julie so that they would feel a sense of deep community with us, even though we are several hours journey away from each other. Specifically, Lord, would you help us to love one another, be devoted to one another, build up one another, care for one another, bear one another's burdens, comfort one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, provoke one another to love and good works, and most importantly, to pray for one another. Lord, as Pastor Sean has reminded us, that there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Lord, help us to continue to embrace from a distance. And Lord, we commend and plan to send Brian and Julie uh, as they begin their service. And we count it a great privilege in Jesus' name. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you to all of you. That was fantastic singing. I will certainly miss the sound of your voices singing alongside uh, side of us. But uh, it's so great to be here this morning. Now, all the other pastors are quite tall. Sean, Caleb, uh, Kevin. Did I get taller after that prayer? <laughs> I was hoping that came with the territory, but uh, I suppose not. But uh, thank you all um, for being here this morning and celebrating along with me and um, being part of the charge. Thank you to Sean and to Caleb for, for your words. Uh, I can't wait to go back and listen to them again and again. Perhaps on that long drive to Petawawa, we'll throw it on YouTube and on the car and we'll listen to them again. Thank you, brothers, for that. Um, all the, some friends and family, my kids, Julie, for being here today. Uh, other family up there and some friends. Uh, so fantastic to be here. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Larson and his wife, Sharon, thanks for driving all the way down from Ottawa. Captain Andrew Whitman, too, thank you for coming. Um, now, I know I'll, I'll embarrass... Uh, Captain Whitman for a second. He was a heritage student, uh, and he finished with the highest honor in the class, where he was awarded the Jack Adams Scott Award. Uh, I've seen his name on the plaque when I went there. Uh, so you're in good company, uh, Andrew. Uh, there's another award winner way in the back, Christian Clement Schlim. I see you back there, Christian, hiding. Um, but uh, he's another award winner as well. So uh, anyways, fantastic um, that you're all here this morning. I just want to read these words from Hebrews 13, 20. I've had to remind myself these words again and again. And as I draw near to the end of my time here at Hespler, uh, they're just so true. List, listen to these words from the author of Hebrews, from the Word of God. It says this, Now may the God of peace, I can just stop there even, may the God of peace. Like, how awesome is that title of God, by the way, in the world that we live in today? May the God of peace. Who brought, you, who brought again from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, here it is, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Those words have stuck with me. Again and again, that, that the author of Hebrews here is praying. He's praying that we, I will be equipped, that we as followers of Christ will be equipped with every good that you may do his will. And when I, when I first left the business world, which I, I absolutely loved, and discerned a call to get into ministry with the Canadian Armed Forces as a chaplain, if you had asked me five years ago, are you ready to get into chaplaincy, I probably would have said, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I can go serve today. Uh, I know what's going on. But I'm so thankful that, one, the military has the wisdom to say, no, we want you to uh, go to seminary to get a degree and uh, to get a master of divinity. We want you to work in a church as a pastor. Five years, we want to equip you so you can come and do the work. I'm so thankful for that because I was woefully unequipped. Uh, I got to go to Heritage, where their motto is to train young men and women up in the gospel so they can be of service to God. And so I got to spend three years there. As I looked over uh, this past week at some of, the, some of the classes that I attended, 
the, the roster of teachers that poured into me read like an all-star roster at any seminary across the country. And men like um, Dr. Rick Reed, who you heard from earlier as a preaching pastor, one of the top preachers in Canada. It's Dr. Stan Fowler, Dr. Uh, David Barker, Dr. Ian Valancourt. Remember that name. He's going to be published a ton in the coming years. Dr. Stephen Ewell, who was in amongst us for so long before going down south back to Texas. You've heard him preach. He was a teacher of mine. Dr. Michael Haken, one of the top history scholars in the world. These were men who taught me at Heritage, just some of them. I, I can't list them all. But those men became friends. I have them, uh, I can text them. They can pour into me. So thankful for my time at Heritage. Uh, again, at the end of that, um, at the end of Heritage, if you would have asked me, are you, are you ready to go serve? I probably would have said, yeah, absolutely. I'm ready, I'm ready to go. But God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that I wasn't. Uh, so he brought me to Hesper Baptist Church, the place that he had ordained from long before. This is where I would come back. I mean, you, many of you know my story. I grew up at the church. I went away and lived my own life for many years. And, and in God's humor, perhaps, he brought me back full circle to Hesper Baptist Church, where I was then able to um, minister among you and labor among you and uh, be loved by you and encouraged by you. I can't tell you how much these past two years have meant to Julie and I to be here at this church. You, you truly, I mean, they say the church is a covenantal family. It truly is. Uh, we will particularly feel the loss when we move away from here. Uh, and so we just want to thank you. And, and we know that uh, it's been often said that seminaries don't make pastors, churches do. Uh, and so I was able to, to work as a, as a pastor, as a minister here among you and Uh, again, back to Hebrews, that God will equip you with everything that you may do his will. God has equipped me. And how has he done that? Well, it's not the church that has equipped me. It's God. So what has he done? How has he done that? He's he's done that through you, right? Through through your prayers, through your time at your house, through, uh, like as we just sung, singing around you, uh, having us go to... um, Funerals and to weddings. Uh, Romans says that in, in a church, we mourn, we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we mourn with those who mourn. How true is that? You know, I think back on the last two years, I, we've had some mourning. Julie's father passed away. My grandmother passed away. We mourned, and you mourned alongside of us. Uh, many of you, some of you, have lost loved ones in the past two years. We've come to your funerals and mourned alongside of you. There's been much rejoicing as well over the past two years. Uh, this Today is a day to rejoice, and you're here rejoicing among us. What, what a blessing that is. What are you doing? You're equipping me. God is using you to equip me. And I trust that uh, over my past years, I've helped equip you. You see, we are all called by God into what it is that we're doing. I'm going off to be a chaplain in the Canadian Armed Forces, God has called you to do something as well in whatever it is that you're doing. If you're a coffee barista, he's called you to do that. If you're a construction worker, he's called you to do that. A stay-at-home mom, he's called you to do that. Uh, An office worker, whatever it is you're doing today, that is what God has called you to do. You are fulfilling your ministry in what God has called you to do. So I I hope that I have equipped you to do that, and I thank you for equipping me. It has been a true blessing, and it's been a true honor. And so thank you to all of you. Uh, I look forward to, to coming back. As, as Sean said, my family is here. I'm stuck with them. Uh, so you are saddled with me for a number of years. This is my home church, and I love you all very much. Uh, and if you would uh, do me the honor, um, well, one last time for today, uh, that we prepared it as well, uh, Peace Like a River. Uh, if you could just sing out, that would be fantastic. So thank you all. God bless.